the graces that we receive in confession is forgiveness of sins. What other grace do we receive in confession? Ah, this is why we're here. This is why we're here, because when I ask Catholics what happens at confession, all of them tell me this. All of them say, I come, I have marks, and God erases them. Everybody tells me that. But there are other graces that we're supposed to receive that people never mention. <laughs> and that's why I give this teaching is because I want people to have the fullness of the grace they're supposed to receive in confession. So, confession is called the sacrament of healing. So some healing is supposed to take place. It's also called the sacrament of conversion. And that's also supposed to take place. And these are the two things we're going to focus on today. Even though... This one here will always be a part of what we're going to talk about. So, confession is one of the seven sacraments, and it's supposed to give us grace. Now, the big question that I have for you is, and this is a, it seems like a simple question, but actually the way we're going to approach it will be a little more, there are seats in the front. things that's going to be important to our conversation today is everybody's favorite topic, sin. What do we mean when we say sin? So can anybody tell me, what is a sin? Yes. Offense against God. An offense against God. Okay. Anything else? A transgression, okay. Separation. Separation, yes. Okay, well we'll we'll keep it at those three for now. Um all three of these are correct. But the direction that we're going in is incomplete. So I want to go to one of the great theologians of the church, St. Augustine of Hippo. Now, if you know St. Augustine, he grew up in what is now the country of Algeria. And St. Augustine couldn't figure out, he couldn't figure out sin. Now, let me tell you the difficulty that he had. Now remember, St. Augustine is a philosopher and a theologian. So he approaches this philo philosophically and theologically. And he says, everything that exists was created by God. So you exist, you must have been created by God. This chair exists, it must have been created by God. The oxygen that we breathe, that must have been created by God. Everything, right? Everything that exists was made by God, right? So where did sin come from? If everything that exists came from God, how can there be sin? God wouldn't make sin. God wouldn't create sin. So where does sin come from? So this was a big question for St. Augustine. And he struggled with this as a philosophical question. Where does sin come from? But he came up with a very interesting answer. And the answer that we're going to give, I'm going to ask you a couple of words, and you're going to tell me what they mean. So if I use the word silence, silence, what does that word mean? Quiet. Well, what does quiet mean? No noise. Okay. So we've got noise, but it's not there. 
So that's quiet. Let me give you another word. Let me give you the word darkness. At night, when it's dark outside, what do we mean by the word darkness? It's no, light. Light. no light. Okay. Now, if you can see what I'm doing here, St. Augustine realized that there are some words that we use not to mean the presence of something, but the absence of something. So when I use the word darkness, I'm not saying here, I have a box of darkness for you. Darkness isn't something. The darkness, or darkness is the absence of something. Light I can measure. Light is energy. And I can tell you how much light is in this room. I can't tell you how much darkness is in the room. Because darkness is nothing. It's the absence of this. The same thing true of quiet or silence. I can't tell you well, how much silence is in the room. What we can measure is noise. We can measure sound. Sounds are waves and we can measure them. There are seats in the front here. Seats up in the front. I know, I know we're Catholics. We don't like the front row. I get it. I get it. So St. Augustine, when he was thinking about sin, he realized God did not create sin. As a matter of fact, he would say sin doesn't actually exist. What sin is, is virtue that's missing. That like darkness or silence, that sin simply means that something is missing. Virtue. Virtue is something that exists. Somebody can have patience or humility or charity. But he would say sin is just that being missed. So he would say, for example, let's say someone is very proud. Okay? So someone says, this person is very proud. Mr. Smith, he's a very proud man. What are we saying about Mr. Smith? He would say, Augustine would say, that we have the virtue humility, and Mr. Smith, he doesn't have very much. So pride would be this is missing. Humility is missing. Greed would mean you don't have generosity. So all of these sins that we would understand as sins aren't really something, they're the absence of something. Something good, something holy that's missing. And so the church and St. Augustine would say, sin is not something. Sin is me confessing that something is missing. That something is absent. Now, I don't know, does anybody here speak Spanish? Spanish, okay. Well, in the Spanish language, if I said, chili sin carne, this means chili without meat. That's what it means in Spanish, okay? So chili without meat. Sin in Spanish means without. It means something's missing. So you can see from the Latin to the Spanish, the word sin has very much the same meaning. Is that it means something's missing. You're without something. So in Spanish, sin means without. So if I were to say the room was without air conditioning, I would say seen air conditioning, meaning that it's without it. And that's what St. Augustine, when he thought of the word sin, he meant there's no virtue. And that's what's missing. Now this is important because as we talk about confession, this is going to play a very, very strong role in our discussion. Okay. Are there any questions up till now? Questions? Oh, good. I've been clear. I'm happy to hear that. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to stay with sin means the absence of virtue. Now, 
I want you to think for a minute, when, when you think of Catholic teaching about sin, let's say I were to steal something, okay? People would say, well, that's a sin, you shouldn't steal. <laughs> but we also have a category called sins of omission. Have you ever heard that phrase, a sin of omission? <clears throat> So if I were to say, well, last night I was supposed to pray, but I fell asleep and I didn't pray, that would be a sin of omission. I didn't do any bad thing. I didn't break any law. But I, I was missing something. So even in the whole concept of sin of omission, we still have this idea that virtue is what we're looking for. Virtue is the good. And when it's missing, that's sin. And, if you want to look at it this way, let's take the virtue of patience. Let's say this person has no patience at all, and this person is very patient, is like the Blessed Mother. That's how patient they are. There's a whole spectrum in between these. So if you're over here, your impatience may be a mortal sin. Or, no, if you're over here, it may be a venial sin. But if it's over here, it may be a mortal sin. So, one sin could be very serious, like impatience. If your impatience means that you yell at your family every day because you're waiting for them. Or impatience could be something that's not very... When I'm in traffic, and the traffic is slow, I put my head back and go, Oh! I hate this. <laughs> well, that's not, that's not something terrible. I'm not hurting anyone. But it would still be, there'd still be something missing. I'm still not patient. <coughs> but it would be the difference between someone who's seriously not patient and someone who is very close to being patient. Okay? So as we understand this, we're kind of looking at any sin can be very serious if we're really, really missing the virtue. But, if we have the virtue sometimes, and at times it gets to be difficult, then that may be a venial sin of the, against that particular virtue. So this is the way we're going to talk about this, the sacrament of reconciliation or, or confession today. Because, how can we find healing? If I went to the doctor, and I said to the doctor, you know, doctor, whenever I move my arm, it really hurts. And the doctor says to me, well, don't move your arm. Is he really helping me? No. I mean, if I don't move my arm, if I tie my arm down and I can't move it, I wouldn't have any pain. But I'm not healed, am I? No. He's not actually treating what's wrong with me, he's just telling me, don't move your arm. Well, the same thing is true of confession. If I go to confession, and I say, okay, I was impatient, and then it gets erased, and then a week later I come back and say, I was impatient, and then it gets erased, and then a week later I come back and say, I was impatient, I'm not really getting healed, am I? All I'm doing is losing the guilt of what I'm doing. But the sacrament isn't supposed to just be that. It's also supposed to be this. It's listed as a sacrament of healing in the list of sacraments. So obviously, I'm not getting any healing if I'm not changing at all, if I'm not experiencing any conversion. And so that's why we need to re-examine the way that we look at confession. Because I think too often, we think, okay, I'm getting a lot of red marks. I'm going to go to confession. The marks get erased. Okay, I'm good till the next time I go to confession. But if that's all it is to us, we're only getting a little bit of the grace that God wants us to have. And what God wants us to have is all of this. He wants our lives to be transformed. And so we need to open our understanding of what confession is so that we can receive the fullness of that sacrament. We good so far?
Okay. So, so what we do is, we have to ask the question, why don't people go to confession? Why don't they go? People have told me, Father, I don't go to confession anymore. The number one reason people tell me they don't go to confession, Father, I confess the same thing every time. I always confess that I'm impatient. I always confess that I gossip. I always confess that I'm greedy. Whatever it is that is their problem, they say, every time I go, I have the same mark. So why bother? Well, if you're just going for this, then they're right. But if you're going for all of this, then it changes. So let's take a look at what we're talking about. When I was in high school, I read an article about Pope John Paul II, who is now Saint John Paul II. And I remember in the article that I read about the Pope, it said he goes to confession every week. Every week. John Paul goes to confession. Now if you're like me, your first thought is, what the heck is he confessing? <laughs> <laughs> the guy's holy. What, what in the world? If he's going once a week, I should be going about every five minutes. <laughs> I mean, what is going on here? But you see... This is because John Paul knew about this. I didn't yet when I read the article, though I came to learn it later. He knew that he wanted to become a saint. And he knew that to become a saint, he had to get virtue. And the way for him to receive virtue was to go to confession. Because one of the graces that he could receive would be conversion. He wanted to be healed. He wanted his life to be changed. For it not simply to be, well, I'm going to go to confession and I'm just simply going to get cleaned off. He actually wanted to become a good man, a good pope. And so he didn't go once a week because he was a bigger sinner than me. He went once a week because he wanted to become a saint more than me. At that time, when I read the article, I was probably going to confession two, three times a year. I didn't go that often, because I didn't really see the need for it. But now that I understand this, I go much more frequently, because I want this. I actually want to be a better person. I want to be changed. And that's what we're going to talk about today in terms of confession, is that when you go into the confessional, and you confess... Father, I've been impatient. Do you go in with the belief that this is the last time you're ever going to confess that? Do you actually believe that you're going to come out different? That you're actually going to change? I don't think most people do. I think most of us assume, I'm going to confess this today, and I'll confess it next time too. And the next time. I don't expect that I'm ever going to change. So I never allow myself to experience these two graces that are supposed to come to me through the sacrament. So, I'm going to change a little bit. The classic definition of the church is a sacrament is an outside, outward sign instituted by Christ that gives grace. But in the New Catechism, in this one, Catechism of the Catholic Church, it adds the phrase, to those who are properly disposed. They add that. And the reason why they add that is because the sacraments are not magic. If I snuck into the room of a Muslim and at night secretly baptized him, it wouldn't turn him into a great Christian. It's not magic. He has to desire the grace. He has to cooperate with the grace. Or else he's not going to get the grace. Well, the same thing is true of us. 
if we want these two things, we have to cooperate with it. How many people do you know who've received baptism, but still act like the devil? You ever met anybody like that? Yeah. I've met a few people like that. And I can tell you, they've got the grace, but they're not properly disposed to receive it. So while in baptism they could have received all this wonderful saving grace, it just sits there, wasted, because they're not, they're not prepared to receive it. They're not prepared to receive the grace. And so we need to recall that while we talk about these sacraments and what the graces are that we're supposed to receive, we're only going to receive them if we're properly disposed. If we go in with faith and say, this is what I'm going to get. Which is why I think a lot of people don't receive the full grace of some sacraments. Because they're not, they're not really receiving the full grace that they could have. And I want to give you an example of this. Very simple example. The body of Christ. What is the body of Christ? The church is the body of Christ. What else do we call the body of Christ? The Eucharist. Yes. Okay. So, when I go into the church, there's a tabernacle. And I stop and I genuflect at the tabernacle. Because the body of Christ is present in the Eucharist. Why don't I genuflect when I meet you? Well, I can tell you why. <laughs> the Eucharist, when the bread is transformed into the body of Christ, there's no resistance. The bread just turns into the body of Christ. The, the, the bread can't fight against grace. The bread simply transforms fully. The bread completely surrenders its nature to Christ. Not so with people. When we are baptized, when we enter the body of Christ, we're still fighting. And so while Jesus wants me to become his body the same way the Eucharist is his body, it's hard. <laughs> because I wrestle with them. And I tell them I don't want to give up all my sins. I don't want to completely surrender my will to your will. I don't want to love people I don't even like. The battle goes on. So while I am the body of Christ, I'm not fully the body of Christ the way the Eucharist is. The same thing is true of all the sacraments. Married couples are supposed to be a sign of Christ and his bride, the church. Not all of them are because they're not properly disposed to receive that grace. Confirmation, holy orders, all of the sacraments, people can receive them, but not fully receive the grace, because they're not disposed to do so. So the bread is completely disposed to become the body of Christ. People, not so much. The only one who completely surrendered to God is Mary. She did so when she said to the angel, your will be done. And so she became the mother of, of Jesus. Mary did that. She was able to fully surrender to God's will. Most of us do not. There's always a wrestling match going on. And some days, I want God's will completely in my life. Other days, I tell him to stay away. I got my own plans. And I think all of us have that battle that goes on. So why don't we always receive these fully? Because it's a battle. So as an example, there was a time I was really, really angry with another guy. Really angry. And I went to confession. And I said, I'm really angry with this guy and I'm having trouble forgiving him. And I go there and my hope is is that I'm going to be converted. I'm going to change. 
But I didn't. After confession, I still was angry. And I probably confessed that sin about eight or nine times. Finally, one day when I was doing my examination of conscience, I realized I'm not angry at him anymore. Finally, I let the healing and the conversion in. I finally submitted myself to that grace. But it was a battle. And so that's why when somebody comes to me and says, Father, I do the same sin over and over again. Why go to confession? And I say, so that you stop doing the same sin over and over again. Because obviously you're not able to stop on your own. You need grace to stop. So go. <laughs> and if you have to go a hundred times, go a hundred times. But every time you need to hope this is the last <coughs> time I will ever confess this sin. Because that's what contrition really is that we're supposed to have for confession is that we actually want to change. If somebody were to come to me, well, let me, let me write that on the board. Contrition. The church says this is necessary to make a good confession. So if you come to me and you say, Father, I'm having an affair. And I said, oh, well, is it still going on? Oh, yeah, I'm seeing them tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> You're not sorry. <laughs> you don't want to change. At that moment, I have to say, get out of here. And what is the grace of the sacrament? That we would suddenly receive the virtue. <clears throat> So if I'm impatient, eventually I become patient. If I'm greedy, eventually I become generous. If I'm judgmental, eventually I become humble. This is what is supposed to happen. When we go to confession, it's supposed to change us. Pope John Paul II became a saint because he wanted this so badly that he went to confession frequently and said, I'm going to get this. You see, once you have this understanding of confession, you realize it's not simply a matter of, well, I have to go on Saturday to go to Eucharist tomorrow, or I only go to confession if I'm in serious sin. I go to confession because I want this. And I could do that once a week. I could do that twice a month. I could do that once a month. I could, I could have confession as often as I need it so that I can grow in this. Now, I'm not saying if you're a good person, you have to go every day. That would be absurd. But what I am saying is, is that the more we desire to be close to Jesus, the more we desire this virtue to fill us instead of the absence of the virtue, then we're going to go to confession to receive that grace. Okay? Any questions so far on what we've said? Yes? So does it mean when you have that, when you have that level of heart, you, uh, do you have to do confession anymore? Well, first of all, he asked the question, once you reach a certain level of virtue, do you still have to go to confession? And my answer is, most virtues, you're not going to ever sit back and say, I have plenty of that. There's pretty much always going to be some examples. But, let's say I do become more patient. So I'm not really finding myself losing my patience. But, I still order a pizza and eat the whole thing. All by myself, the whole pizza. Okay, well that's another virtue that I'm looking for. I need moderation in my eating of my pizza. So there's always virtues we need to grow in. So if I ever came to you and say, said, do you want to go to confession? And you were to say, I have no sin? My, my belief would be, you have no idea about this. You don't know what sin really is. When people tell me they don't have any sin, what that means is, I haven't done anything really, really bad. I haven't robbed a bank, I haven't killed anybody, so I'm okay. But the saints and the Catholic Church say, no, sin is much more than that. 
Sin is simply what's missing that keeps us from becoming the men and women we're supposed to be. And if you read the lives of the saints, the very, very holy saints, in their own writings they say, I am filled with sin. They recognize their own wretchedness. Because the closer you get to God, the more you recognize that you're not God. <laughs> and the more you recognize that you're not perfect. And so there'll always be something. But I will say, if two people were to come to confession, and one person came and said, well, Father, I stole money from work, I, I hit my spouse, and I stole the car. And another person came in and said, well, Father, I meant to pray for an hour, but I only prayed for 45 minutes. And somebody asked me for some money, but I only had a couple dollars, so I only gave them a couple dollars. If I looked at those two confessions, I would say, this person is not seeking holiness. They're seeking, I, want, I just don't want to feel guilty anymore. The second person, this is someone who's really seeking holiness. They want to have healing and conversion in their life. Because they're growing. And you can see that they're not really committing a lot of sins of commission anymore. A lot of it is sins of omission or things I could be doing better, but I'm not doing. I, I always joke when I go to a convent to hear the confessions of the nuns, you hear very few serious sins. I said it's like being stoned with cotton balls. <laughs> they're throwing these little light sins at you, and I'm like, all right, well... It's good. It makes sense why there would be a penance. Let's say someone comes to me and says, Father, I'm greedy. I want everything for myself. I don't like to share. So what they do is they confess greed. Well, the virtue that they're missing is generosity. So what I do is I say, okay, for your penance, I want you to give a donation to some charity. And it could be the church or it could be somebody else. But you see, what I'm trying to do is undo this. I'm trying to give them the virtue that they're missing. I'll give you another example. Let's say a young man comes to me and he says, Father, I've been looking on the computer and I've been looking at women with lust on the computer. So he confesses lust to me. Well, I could say to him, well, say three Hail Marys, and that's it. But I'm really not addressing what he's confessed to me. So what I do is I'll say to him, okay, what is wrong with lust? Why is lust bad? Lust is bad because it takes a person, in this case it would be a woman, but it could be a man as well. It takes a person and it turns them into an object. This chair is an object. I can sit on that chair, and I don't really care what the chair thinks. Because the chair is just an object. It's there for my use. And I can use it for whatever I want. I can stand on the chair. I can sit on the chair. I can throw the chair out into the yard. I can do whatever I want with it. It's a thing. Lust turns a person into a thing. You exist to please me. You're here so that I get my thrill. You're just an object. You're not a person. Well, that's what makes it a sin, is you're taking a person, someone Jesus loves, and you're turning them into a thing. You're just here to please me. So what I might give as a penance is I'll say, okay, what you need to do is you need to pray for the women that you saw on the internet. You need to pray that they come to Jesus. That they experience salvation. Now why would I give that as a penance? Because once you start praying for her, Zelda, you start praying for Zelda to go to Jesus, she's not an object anymore. Now she's a person Jesus died for. Now she's someone who Jesus wants to save. She's not a thing anymore, just a body. She's actually someone who's important to God. And once I start to believe that, it makes me very hard for me to turn her into an object anymore. 
Because I want to see her saved. I want to see her come to Jesus. She's a daughter of God. And I don't want to treat her like a piece of garbage. And so when we do penance, what priests are supposed to do, and I know that not every priest does this, but what we're supposed to do is look at what you have confessed and give you some penance that directs you towards the virtue that you're missing. So one of my favorites is if somebody comes to me and says, Father, I gossip. Okay, I talk about other people. Well, what I'll say to them is, do you have a Bible? And most Catholics will say yes, though I've actually heard a couple Catholics say, no, Father, I don't own a Bible, which is terrible. But if they gossip, so I'll say, I want you to go to James in the Bible, chapter 3. And I want you to slowly and prayerfully read through that one chapter. And that chapter is all about speech. How speech can do good and speech can do harm. And how we speak controls what direction our life is going to go in. And all that is said by James. So I have them read that slowly and prayerfully so they can begin to think about what direction their life is heading in. And so what I always try to do is give someone a penance that sets them more on the right course. That helps them to experience the virtue that they're missing to replace the sin. Because remember, the healing you're supposed to experience doesn't come from just, well, I used to throw rocks at this guy and now I don't anymore. That's not really healing. What is healing is, I used to throw rocks at this guy, but now I'm changed. And I'm a better person and I wouldn't even think of doing that anymore. Because I've gone from anger at him to forgiveness. Well, see, now I've changed. I've got the virtue that I was missing before. So now I'm a different person. And so what's supposed to happen when we give a penance is that we're directing the person towards the virtue that they're missing. Now, some Protestants will say, well, you Catholics, you go to, you know, you go out in the world and you could kill somebody or rob a bank or whatever. You go to confession, you say three Hail Marys and you're fine. You're a bunch of hypocrites. And I say, well, if that's the way priests are doing confession, that is a problem. Because if somebody kills somebody or robs a bank, to simply say, well, say three Hail Marys, doesn't really address what they've done or the seriousness of what they've done. So they're all, the penance always needs to direct them towards a changed life. So if someone comes to me and says, Father, I'm committing adultery, and I say, well, has it ended? And they say, no. The first thing I'll say is, well, come to me when you want to end it. Because I can't, I can't even give you absolution until you, you've repented. So I at least have to have that much. So you always have to lead the person away from the sin and towards the virtue rather than just give some generic penance. So I was telling the group earlier, I have a good friend, and he's given me permission to speak about this because, as you know, we're not allowed to speak about what we hear in confession ever. But if somebody gives me permission to, then I can and a friend of mine once confessed to me that sometimes he argues with his wife and he gets really angry and he yells at her. And he makes her cry. And he feels really bad about that. So as a penance, I said to him, I want you to take an egg, a raw egg, and I want you to put it in your coat pocket. And I want you to keep it in there for three days. And you have to make sure that the egg doesn't get broken. And if it does, you have to start over and do it for another three days. And I want you to think of that egg as your wife. Because what you need to learn is the virtue of gentleness. And so I'm going to give you this egg as, a, as a, an exercise so that when you are with your wife, you're thinking of someone who you need to be gentle with. You don't want to break her. 
You actually want to treat her with kindness and gentleness. And the two of you may still argue, but it will never get to a place where you're, you're angry and screaming. Well, he told me that he broke two eggs. <laughs> the third one he did for three days. And he said the next time he and his wife started to argue, he yelled at her. She started to cry. And he said immediately he thought of the egg. And he said, oh, man. And he told me things have gotten much better. That now when the two of them argue, it doesn't get nearly as angry as it did before. I was trying to help him to learn the virtue that he was missing. And so I think that if priests do their job, they're going to help people to find the virtue that's missing. Are there any questions about that? I have just one little bit here left at the end, but I want to make sure that so far everything has been clear. You still good? All right. So the final thing that I want to talk about is, we talked about the sacraments as an outward sign instituted by Christ to give grace. If a person is properly disposed, then they'll fully receive the grace that they've received. That these are three of the graces that we look for in confession. Forgiveness of sin, healing, and conversion. And that we have to be as surrendered as we can for that grace to take place. So this is what I'm trying to get across. The next time you go to confession, whenever that is, I want you to think about what you're confessing. Okay, I'm confessing I was lazy. I didn't do the work I was supposed to do yesterday. Um, I watched too much TV. And I need, to, I need to not watch as much TV. Whatever it is that you're confessing. And I want you to think to yourself, what would happen in my life if these sins were just gone? If they never happened again? Because really, that's what God wants to happen when you go to confession. When I go into that confessional, because I know this, I go in and say, Lord... I hope this is the last time I ever confess this. I want to be changed. I want to be a new person when I come out. I want to come out of that confessional and people say, who is that? That's not the same guy who went in. That's what I want to happen every time. Now, because I'm not as surrendered to God as bread, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it takes me some practice. It takes me some time. I have to confess this several times. I have to work on it. And I have to find myself more and more disposed to letting go of the sin that, I, that I'm too attached to. But ultimately, what God wants to give us is that through our penance, we embrace the new virtue. And in that, we experience healing and conversion. That is what every confession should be like for us. And I can tell you, if you grab a hold of this, if you actually start using this understanding and actually have faith that God is able to do this, no matter how long I've been doing this sin, God has the ability to change me and to make me a better man or woman, as the case may be, then confession begins to become something very powerful and transforming for us. We have probably about eight friends who were Protestants and they became Catholics. I'm just checking to see you got water. Yes, so we still have so some. Hot. Thank you. And they became Catholics and one of the main reasons why they became Catholics was so that they could go to confession. Because they saw how much confession meant to me. I would leave and I'm like, yes! A new life, a new chance. Now I'm going to get it right. And when they looked at that, they said, 
man, you get something out of that that I don't get. And so some of them wanted to go. And so they became Catholic. And I got to tell you, when they went to RCIA, and the RCIA teacher said, why do you want to become a Catholic? And they said, to go to confession. The RCIA teacher would say, what? <laughs> Not even Catholics want to go to confession. What are you talking about? But that's, that's really who we are. When you look at the lives of the saints, what you see is, is they went to confession with joy. Because they knew, my life's going to be changed. And if it's not changed today, it'll be changed the next time. But eventually, I'm going to become the person I'm supposed to be. And it, it turned the world upside down when they were able to, to receive that. Okay. That's basically... Everything that I've prepared. Are there any questions? We've got about 15 minutes. Now we can end early if people don't have any questions. But do people have any questions or anything that they want? Yes. Um, I like the idea of the Vashu missing. Um, so, like, uh, for example, something like laziness or anger, what Vashu is that be that is lacking? Well, it depends on the particular, but like, Laziness, oftentimes what's missing is zeal. Or anger, oftentimes what's missing is either gentleness or forgiveness. And again, it depends on the, um, the situation. If they've, if they've harmed you, then it may be forgiveness. If it's just, I don't like anybody who wears green, well then that's, they haven't harmed you, it's just that you've got a problem with... <laughs> With, with your anger, and, and you need to learn to be more gentle and to be more understanding, those sorts of things. So it depends. But for most of them, I mean, there are virtues that you can clearly see. And it's like, oh, yeah, see, this clearly shows that I'm missing something. Yes? Can you briefly explain the Vashu Our sin separates us from each other? Yeah, and from God. Yes, okay. Well, sin, if you remember, we spoke about it as a lack of virtue. If you consider God, God is all good. So to get to God, we need virtue, because virtue is goodness. So the less virtue we have, the less close we are to God. And so the virtue that we're seeking is to unite us more to God. And because we are the body of Christ, it also begins to separate us from each other. Because if your sin is harming all of us, then it causes a separation. And, uh, you know, so many people think, well, my sin is private. You know, what I do in my house is my business. I'm not hurting anybody else. And, of course, the Bible doesn't say that. St. Paul says, if one member of the body of Christ sins, then the whole body suffers. And so because we are one body, there is a necessary relationship that sin would cause disunity among us. Okay, well, if there are no other questions, let us conclude in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for your gifts of grace. We especially thank you, Lord God, for the sacraments that bring us life, and for your love and for your church that constantly call us to a deeper conversion. We ask, Lord Jesus, that your blessing might be upon all of those who today considered this beautiful sacrament of confession, that your love and your grace might come upon them, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.